I had a feeling that the students would be ahead of the adults in embracing this technology. And that tells me um, that it's only going to go um, further and more from here. I'm really an advocate for embracing the use of these tools. I also think that AI can be uh, a tool to promote equity um, for different populations like the ones that we serve at Nifty and at NACI. Welcome to Forward with NACI, Inspiring Entrepreneurial Action, a podcast that shares the stories of everyday entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial leaders, and the communities that support us. We hope that this diverse collection of stories brings you inspiration, inspires you to take action, and ignites entrepreneurship in your community as we make our way forward together. Welcome to this episode of Forward with NACI. I'm Rebecca Corbin, the president and CEO of NACI and the host of this podcast. And we're coming to you uh, today from Washington, D.C. Um, both one of my guests and myself are here at the Association for Community College Trustees Conference, along with about 13 other people from around the country. So I'm excited to have our guests on this morning. We're going to learn a little bit about them and their organization and delve into topics about AI and success uh, in post-secondary and then kind of wrap up with business development. So I'd like to um, welcome both of you today and I'm going to begin with you, J.D. LaRock, and um, tell us a little bit about you and maybe your career path and what led you to doing the work you're doing today. Sure. Thanks, Rebecca. And great to be on the podcast with uh, you and all of your viewers and listeners. So, you know, I come from one of those families where everybody is involved in public education. And that's uh, that's what happened to me, too. So I started my career as a spokesperson for the New York City school system, became a television reporter covering education. And then after I got my doctorate, I pivoted to become a policymaker because I really wanted to, um, to do more to help young people um, have expanded opportunities. Uh, so uh, I went to Capitol Hill, worked for Senator Ted Kennedy on uh, bills relating to higher education and career and technical education, and then followed that up working for uh, each of the uh, Massachusetts last two governors, Deval Patrick and Charlie Baker. Uh, for Deval Patrick, I was his education policy director, trying to improve schools at all levels for all students in Massachusetts. And then for Charlie Brick, Baker was his workforce development chief, um, re really trying to expand opportunities for, uh, for youth development, including entrepreneurship. And so uh, that was the um, actually the spark uh, that lit the fire um, when I came over to NIFTY, the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship, which has existed for 40 years, uh, but I've been leading it for the last four years. And we work around the country and around the world providing high-quality entrepreneurship education programs to students in high schools, middle schools, and in post-secondary settings. And we are one of the largest organizations of our type, serving about 60,000 students worldwide each year. And I just feel that entrepreneurship is not only something that is really important for the identity of our country and something that many young people want to do, it's also a fantastic way to learn. It's a fantastic way for young people to learn about themselves, what they're passionate about, uh, and how they can turn those passions into uh, a lifelong pursuit that supports themselves and their families. So I think it's one of the greatest things that I've been involved in. And I'm uh, really glad to have my colleague, Kenny Turner here, who leads our post-secondary work uh, and who has really expanded Nifty's impact in that way. That's amazing. I, I didn't know all of those things about you. I knew a little bit and I knew you were a wonderful spokesperson. Uh, so it's sort of fitting that we're back here in, in D.C. And, and you have a great team around you, as you mentioned, with uh, Kenny Turner. So, Kenny, let's go to you and maybe you can speak a little bit about your background, some of the work that you've done and what brought you uh, to working with Nifty. Absolutely. Hey, Dr. Corbin, and pleasure to be here uh, as well. And um you know, I, my story was a little bit nonlinear. I grew up in Queens, New York, uh, Jamaica, Queens, New York, and was completely inspired by the street entrepreneurs around me, the um, the community that, you know, found a way to be resilient, uh, doing a lot with a little. It seemed like everyone was taking their craft, their creativity, their gift, their natural gifts and talent and turning it into an income uh, revenue generating opportunity or figuring out a way to do so. And so that, you know, livelihood of entrepreneurship, it wasn't 
labeled that way in the 90s and early 2000s, um, exactly the same way it is today. But that natural resiliency and, and just grit of, of the city and just taking in, you know, um, all of those elements where so many entrepreneurs from those communities came out of, um, you know, I, you know, had a chance to feel entrepreneurship before I actually learned about it. And so, you know, <laughs> traditionally, so, um, you know, so fast forward, you know, I ended up coming across uh, Nifty while I was in New York City. I became an educator for Nifty, uh, you know, working with uh, within school systems and nonprofit programs. I also then became a teacher trainer for Nifty. Um, for about 10 years, I trained teachers all over the country, uh, as well as outside of the country on how to implement entrepreneurship in um, in under-resourced communities, because that's where I was from. I felt like I was the perfect voice. Uh, I went through the School of Hard Knocks like a lot of other people, and I got the formal education after. I got under, my undergrads in business. My master's is, is in transformational urban leadership. And I'm now you know, in my doctorate program for business administration. Uh, but I'd never forget all of those lessons learned about entrepreneurship uh, right in the neighborhood. And you know, it's a pleasure to work with Nifty to be able to go back to those neighborhoods like mine so that I can continue to have these conversations about ownership, about equity, about where we fit into these conversations and how we have tools to help you think entrepreneurially and, you know, and to collaborate with other organizations like NACI uh, and community colleges and, you know, workforce agencies to help bring that a reality because it's still relevant today uh, for the young people coming up, just like it was for me. But now there's more labels, there's more technology, there's more definition, there's more strategy, um, there's more policy, you know, than, than before. And so we're excited to be on this side of it, of the coin to, to help uh, bring that education to the communities that uh, so desperately need it. So that's how I got involved with Nifty, yep. <laughs> it's a great story and it really speaks to the importance of lifelong learning. And you know, what some of the work that we do at NACI is really um, giving people language like you all do with young people, but also thinking about people in different categories that may wanna you know, not be part of the corporate world anymore, want to start their own business or people um, that by life circumstances need to kind of get into an entrepreneurial activity, whether they've, um, you know, had a, a life event that's kind of um, led them in that direction. Kenny, I remember too, one of my fond memories of 2023 was our time together at the Entrepreneurial Funders Network when we were at that amazing gathering in Venice Beach. And I, it's something I had seen in the movies before and it looked exactly like that, which kind of blew me away. Um, and I think that really gets to um, kind of where we're headed. And JD, you talked about that a bit. And I know something that you've been thinking about and writing about is really the influence of AI um, in higher education. So maybe you could share with us a little bit about um, how you see uh, AI really impacting uh, the work that we all do and even beyond higher education in careers. And, and how do we prepare ourselves for that? Absolutely. So um, Nifty programs culminate with a competition series in the spring. And uh, last spring, on the heels of all the hype around chat GPT and, and large language models and generative AI, I asked myself, I wonder, will we see AI popping up in this year's competitions with our high school students and our other learners? And the answer, of course, was yes. Uh, we saw students, without prompting from anybody, just in and of themselves, using AI tools as a way to power their business ideas. So AI-based businesses where AI is the facilitator of the product or the service that they're trying to uh, put together. Uh, and they were using AI uh, to, uh, to put together their business plans, to put together their pitch decks, to put together their financials using graphic AI tools. So again, I had a feeling that the students would be ahead of the adults in embracing this technology. And that tells me um, that it's only going to go um, further and more from here. So I, when I think about AI in the community college setting or the high school setting, I'm really an advocate for embracing the use of these tools. I also think that AI can be 
uh, a tool to promote equity um, for different populations like the ones that we serve at Nifty and at NACI. So for example, one thing I've noticed is that students use a tool like ChatGPT uh, to generate ideas. They may not think of themselves as an entrepreneur. They may get stuck thinking of uh, uh, of an idea for a new business. So they can ask GPT, give me some business ideas to solve this problem in my community or this, you know, this situation that I know about. And it'll be that prompt will generate a few ideas and get them thinking. Uh, another way that I've seen students from diverse backgrounds utilize tools like GPT-4 is uh, to ask them to help uh, help edit uh, and craft language. So, you know, we work with students who are disadvantaged. We work with students who are immigrants. We work with students whose uh, first language is not English. And these tools are not a substitute for the mastery that students will need, but they are an aid. And there, I've seen the seen it be a very helpful aid. So at Nifty, uh, and in the larger work I do in my civic life with community colleges, I'm just a big advocate for uh, for adopting AI tools because I think it's pretty clear uh, that we're only going to see them become more widespread in their use and their importance going forward. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's a road that we've traveled before, right? A couple decades ago, everybody remembers uh, that's probably in our age category, AOL and, and the initial dial up. And some people, you know, embraced it um, like you all are doing with AI. And then some people were a little more laggards to come along. But um, I love that you're in that space and, and thinking about it of how do we um, really make sure that people aren't left behind because we know that with the digital divide and some of the broadband um, access issues. And it kind of goes to, you were talking about the young people that you work with. And I thought, JD, maybe you could begin and Kenny could um, expand upon it, um, this idea of post-secondary pathways. So those who might be listening that aren't uh, too familiar with uh, the higher ed or the education space, maybe you could talk about what is that and how some of the work that you're doing at NIFTY um, lends itself to opening up opportunities for young folks. Yeah, post-secondary pathways play out in a number of ways, a number of ways in the work that we do. So I'll give you one example. We have a strong foothold in career and technical high schools. And the reason for that is students there are typically being educated in a skill or a trade, you know, HVAC, automotive, electrician, plumbing, et cetera. And we combine entrepreneurship with those skills-based programs because we want to send the message that um, you can turn that skill into a business and you can then articulate into a post-secondary program to get further business and entrepreneurship skills, say at a community college, so you can, um, you know, really um, have a, a, a whole life-sustaining career um, with what with the combination of the skill and trade that you've picked up, plus the entrepreneurial know-how. So that's, uh, so for us, the work we do in high schools uh, feeds strongly into post-secondary education. And I would say for the population we serve, you know, underserved communities, underestimated communities, commu community colleges in particular are the pathway for many of our students. So that's, that's one, that's one way. The, and the other way, and this actually was the genesis of much of the work that Kenny uh, is leading on our own in-house post-secondary work, we're always asking ourselves the question for our students, what's next? What more can we give them? And, you know, um, Kenny, why don't you say a word about, you know, the students that you've worked with now and over the years, you know, who've come back to us saying, you know, I, I love Nifty, but I, I'm, I'm building my business. I want more. I want more from you, but I want more from post-secondary education too. Absolutely. Yeah, no. And, um, you know, for some, the entrepreneur journey, you know, I never forget, I gave a couple of stories, so many stories. Um, but for the sake of time, I never forget, you know, um, you know, I moved from New York to L.A. I was a program director working directly with schools here in Los Angeles area. And uh, one day I walked into a high school and uh, I was wearing my nifty polo this right before the pandemic hit. And the student uh, was in the, you know, kind of in the lobby, um, you know, waiting waiting for someone and he saw my nifty polo and he goes uh nifty oh you guys do that entrepreneurship or business program i took you guys in ninth grade or 10th grade forget what it was it was a couple of years ago and um he said you know what it was because of that program 
um, well, because of his entrepreneur, just the, the spark of entrepreneurship uh, learning, um, he was going to college. And he said, I probably wouldn't be going to college, you know, if I hadn't experienced that program. Like he literally told me, you know, in so many words, that's what he was saying. That really kept him going. You know, and entrepreneurship education is uh, not always about, you know, uh, forming the business right away. Um, the entrepreneurial journey for some is about motivation, is about not quitting, is about, uh, you know, finding new uh, sparks so that they don't stop. Right. And so if that's what the way we position ourselves uh, so students can have, you know, a sense of belonging, like they can have a sense of, uh, hey, I be you know, I, I belong in this world, you know, and, um, you know, I think it's an awesome place to, to position ourselves in education. Right. And so, um, you know, I think of, you know, so many alum who have come back and done so many amazing, I mean, the list, you know, goes on in terms of how they've used entrepreneurship education to keep themselves motivated in the world of work and in entrepreneurship and, you know, combining AI, you know, I just, you know, one of our one of our alum, you know, came back to us recently and said after several businesses and um, his name is Cody Chang. And he he came back. He just created a, a business called Tier One that helps entrepreneurs, uh, you know, and schools and, and who teach entrepreneurship uh, help students build their business plans and use generative AI to think of ideas and, you know, take away some of those questions from the teacher so that they can focus on uh, other ways to build the student. And the student can use this generative AI tool to help them, you know, with the key parts of their business that's tied to Nifty's curriculum. It's amazing, right? So to hear those stories and kind of continuously see that uh, and to know that, you know, in terms of a, you know, pathway in terms of post-secondary, uh, being a part of, you know, the journey of helping students think entrepreneurially, um, whether, the, whether that change is drastic, dramatic, or whether it's just small shifts, small shifts in thinking that keeps them going is a pleasure to, you know, to constantly collaborate and think about new new ways to do that um, so that entrepreneurship could just rise to new levels uh, in Pathways and in the world of work. And, uh, you know, I think this it's just great to be able to have this conversation more to figure out, continue to figure out ways and expose ways that that could be successful for our students. Yeah, it's great to hear the passion that you both have. Um, in this space. And, and I think, too, you know, sometimes opportunities come to you, whether it's small shifts, as you're mentioning, or big, audacious opportunities. But if you have that entrepreneurial mindset, you're ready to kind of take that step. And, you know, one thing, um, as you all full well know, is that National Entrepreneurship Week is in February. So um, there's lots of organizations like ours that are celebrating um, around, you know, around the country. It's a congressionally designated holiday. And um, NACI has a big announcement on uh, February 14th um, in terms of a tech solution that we acquired as a, a large charitable donation. So I think about the work that you do with young people that we do uh, with um, college students and along the gamut and, and where is that going to take us to the future? So as we all know, you know, during the pandemic, there were record levels of small businesses that were created. Uh, NACI is headquartered in North Carolina, and they just saw a boom. You know, the uh, Secretary of State uh, would share with us they were having trouble just keeping up with the number of businesses that were created, whether they were um, tied to skilled trades or Main Street businesses or even more tech businesses. So, as we kind of wind up our our conversation today, I'd love to go back to you, JD. And talk about, you know, um, you, we've talked sort of broadly about entrepreneurial mindset and higher education and those kinds of things. But what about um, small business development? Because you do amazing things with with young people and giving them language, but but some of them actually take off and create these businesses and become lifelong entrepreneurs. So maybe speak to that. And then, Kenny, we can wrap up with you. Maybe you can give us a couple of examples of uh, students that have uh, started very kind of interesting or unique businesses? I think what we've learned from our work over the years is that, number one, students who really lean into the rigor of our program and who have the opportunity to uh, take a nifty class uh, multiple times uh, really, um, really do gain that entrepreneurial mindset that you talked about and that we also talk about as a, an important concept for us. Another key component is mentorship. 
so our program is bolstered by the efforts of corporate and community volunteers who come into high school classrooms and college classrooms and who assist students in the development of different aspects of their business plan. And our research has shown that the students who actually translate into entrepreneurs for a career, um, they tend to have um, long-standing relationships with their nifty mentors long after they completed the program. And so that tells us something important for the communities that we work with. And it's kind of an obvious point when you think about it, but, you know, the, the careers, the lives that these mentors are showing our young students, those things are not visible necessarily in the communities where our students come from. Um, but the professional support and the real relationship is a linchpin of, of, of that uh, successful entrepreneurial relationship. The other thing I'd say is, and we touched on it earlier, and Kenny, you can say more about it too. Um, eventually, even students who have taken a nifty class a couple of times and who launch their businesses, as many nifty students do, um, participating in our program for the first and second time, they'll reach a point where they're they're making revenue. Um, they're they're and they they'll come back to us and they they'll say, you know, my business is up and running. I'm making money, and, and I realize. I need legal services. I need to incorporate my business. I need a real p and l. I need an accountant. And they come to us. And Kenny has has been, among other things, um, been a leader in coordinating our extended services to our 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 graduates of nifty programs who come back to us. So, Kenny, I'd love for you to share a little bit about you know what what these successful young entrepreneurs, you know are are saying about what their needs are uh, in the long run. Yeah, you know, you know, it's interesting. And, um, you know, uh, for example, you know, we've created something called the Founders Forum. The Founders Forum is basically a an incubator for uh, alum who go, you know, students who go through the NIFTY program to come back uh, to get uh, strict services uh, and mentorship to build their business to the next level. And it's so interesting because we get um, we get all types of students who uh, may have taken Nifty seven years ago. They've gone through college. They they've got their MBAs. They come back and say, "Can you help me with my business?" So, to, so we we position ourselves to uh, with that service and other services in the in the uh, alumni services department too, for, for for students to come back and continuously get help. And uh, you know, in particular, you're in DC. There's you know, awesome. There's this awesome pedigree right there uh, in DC. There's a restaurant. If you get a chance to go by, it's called Half Smoke. Uh, Half Smoke is one of our alum uh, who has come back several times, spoken to, um, you know, our Nifty community and uh, the founder and um, amazing. I think there's multiple locations now, JD, if I'm not mistaken, uh, of Half Smoke there. There's also Market 7 right there in uh, in D.C. as well, uh, which um, which is an awesome business to help, uh, you know, bridge the gap, you know, in, in equity and just allow entrepreneurs uh, to uh, get gain more opportunity there in the DC area. There's also um, Groom Guy, the founder of Groom Guy. Groom Guy uh, is also in that <laughs> DC area, which uh, you know is an upscale kind of grooming service, and um, is a, he's currently in uh, a couple of hotels uh, and locations uh, around the DC area, and also just signed a contract with the PGA Tour. So um, we have these stories and so many others who. I've come back and I've mentioned uh, already Cody Chang in, in tier one. I've mentioned uh, we can go on and talk about Jasmine Lawrence. We can talk about who uh, started an awesome hair care business uh, that uh, has gone around the country, maybe even around the world. Um, you know, and uh, so uh, so there's a lot. And all of these um, examples are on our website, nifty.com. You can check it out. You can kind of see more of the alumni uh, that have come back and, um, you know, really been beneficial when, you know, speaking to this next generation that's coming up behind them and seeing, hey, can, is this really possible uh, for for us? And so uh, so we're, we're, we're grateful to be able to uh, not only, you know, uh, offer the learning, but also continue the learning uh, with our, you know, uh, with our tools and our resources, but also, as J.D. mentioned, our support from the community. We couldn't have done, we couldn't do things like this uh, without uh, partners that come back and mentor, come back um, and help uh, students who uh, need the support along the way. So just a lot of great examples that, um, you know, uh, we can take that can continue to drive us as an organization to support. 
I love that. I wrote that down, half smoke. Now you've challenged me, both of you. <laughs> so I have a meeting downtown. I'm actually going to seek that out. And I am going to uh, share that out on social media if I can find it. Um, but I I think as we kind of wrap up today, I just, I'm inspired by uh, your stories and the work that you do. But I think that's... Um, really the way that we're going to move forward and, and, you know, grapple with all of these big audacious opportunities like AI and, and some of the even challenges that, that JD and I have been hearing about from uh, leaders in DC about how things are, you know, sort of polarized to some degree, but, but stable. So how do we work within that 10 yards of space where we can really uh, make a difference on sort of this field of, um, I guess, dreams is what we're, we're calling it. So I want to thank you both. I'm, I'm really um, honored that you would spend uh, the morning with us. We're going to be releasing this episode um, during National Entrepreneurship Week. So we uh, hope that all of your members and supporters around the world will listen to it and we're going to be pushing it out on our end. So uh, I wish you both a wonderful day and, um, and thank you for sharing your stories. Thank you for having us. I really appreciate you and all, all of the leadership that you and Nancy are providing as well. We are uh, glad to be friends and partners in your fine organization. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you will continue to explore the many ways to define entrepreneurship with Nacy as we celebrate opportunity, failing forward, and success, learning from one another along the way. Subscribe to this podcast on your favorite platform and follow at NACI on social media and learn more about us at NACI.com forward slash podcast. Stay tuned for a new episode each week. We look forward to making our way forward together with you.